I'm going to let Megan introduce herself and um, turn the time over to her. So go ahead, Megan. Thanks, Andrea. Um, hi, everybody. I'm Megan Steinbach. I'm a registered and certified dietitian. Um, I work here at St. Mark's Hospital. Been a dietitian for many, many years. Um, I've worked here at St. Mark's for about three. So I work in the Diabetes Education Center, and I also work in the um, Metabolic and Nutrition Services Center. So um, let's just get started. I think the topic today is a great one. I wanted to just um, identify what feeling your best means. I think that's something that is a little bit different for everybody. So as far as our scope for today, this is what we're going to define that as. Eating in a way that will help you have more energy, keep your body healthy, maintain a healthy weight for you, which might be different from what you see on the BMI charts. Um, also, if you have any medical conditions or allergies that you're eating in a way that you're able to experience less frequent symptoms from those illnesses. We're going to touch on some habits that I feel like will um, contribute to good nutrition and help you to feel your best. So we're just going to work through those one at a time. And that's the overview there. So I think number one is being aware. It's hard to improve your diet if you don't know where you're currently standing. Um, so thinking about your own habits, do you feel like you have a good relationship with food? I think in our culture these days, it's hard to know exactly what is good nutrition. Um, it's hard to know which resources or um, information to trust. There is a plethora of information on the internet and you do need to be careful about where you're getting your information from. There's lots of popular diets these days and a lot of times we have clients that come in and just kind of want to sift through that information and know what's best for them. So you need to know what um, is going on with your own diet. For some people that might mean tracking. Tracking can be helpful or keeping a food journal, not only what you're eating, but also what your feelings are around eating or what the circumstances might be. For example, if I'm eating breakfast, how am I feeling? Am I actually hungry at that time of day? Do I feel like I'm um, upset from anything that's going on? Am I bored? What other things are going on that's influencing what I'm, what I'm eating and when I'm eating? Um, reading labels can also increase our awareness of the foods that we're eating. I think we're, we're going to talk more about these things, slowing down the pace of your eating. Avoiding multitasking helps you be more aware of what you're eating um, and how you're feeling while you're eating. Also, as far as, you know, tracking and journaling, that can help you not only with your feelings around food, but also um, any symptoms that you're having related to medical issues or possibly medication. So tracking can be helpful in identifying patterns. I do want to note, though, that if you feel like tracking is something that you become obsessive over or you feel like it is taking too much of your time, then it may not be the most effective tool for you to use. Um, it's just meant to be um, a way to investigate what's going on without judgment. And I think that's the key there. So again, what is your relationship with food? We know that signs of a poor relationship, typically um, where you're, if you're feeling like there are good and bad foods, and that is something that our culture that is very focused on dieting has kind of ingrained in us is that there are good foods and there are bad foods. So we're trying to get you to get away from that kind of thinking um, that with you know, getting rid of that vocabulary, that also helps to reduce feelings of guilt or shame that might come from eating certain foods. Um, but knowing that there is not a morality to eating. Um, FOMO, you know, if you're restricting or on a certain diet, feelings that you're you're missing out on something is usually a sign that um, the relationship that you have with food is not healthy. Um, hiding food or eating in secret. If you are afraid to eat around other people or you're ashamed to eat in front of other people, that also indicates a poor relationship with food. Um, telling your body when it's hungry. And we're gonna talk more about what that means, but our bodies are made um, with intuitive signals to help us know when it's time to eat and when we need fuel. And again, that's something that oftentimes if you've dieted a lot, 
is kind of lost along the way. Um, you know, instead of being in tune with when you're hungry or when you need to eat, it becomes more about how many calories you've eaten or if you've used all your points. So we're trying to get back to just the intuitiveness of eating um, and being able to recognize what your body's cues are. What the hell eating? We've probably all experienced that a little bit. If you've ever been on a diet or you feel like there are good and bad foods and you've part, you know, you've enjoyed eating something that may be on the bad list, um, sometimes that can trigger kind of a downward, downward spiral where you feel like, well, I've already eaten that food, so I might as well just not care. So we want to get away from that as well. Signs that your nutrition plan is working or that you're having a positive, more positive relationship with food. You're feeling satisfied after your meals instead of eating and not feeling like it was really something that either you enjoyed or that actually helped your hunger subside. Um, if your mood is improved, if you feel more confidence, if you're sleeping better or longer than, than you were before, um, if you're consistently having more energy, if you're able to do the activities of your day and even exercise um, without feeling worn down, if you're able, you know, if one of your goals is to increase your strength or increase your activity, are you fueling your body enough to be able to increase your strength and endurance as you increase that activity? Um, so a good question too is to ask yourself, whatever habits I'm trying to adapt, are those habits more of a lifestyle or are they a diet? Um, and something that can help you evaluate that is how long do you feel like you'd be able to sustain those changes? If it's something that is not sustainable for you know, the long run, ask yourself, can I follow this for three to six months? Will it last for a year? Can I actually adapt this for a lifetime? So part of evaluating your relationship with food is understanding what hunger is and what other things or triggers, we call them, might lead to eating. One of those, and they're kind of all grouped together under emotional eating, um, is recognizing, you know, when you're not eating for hunger, what are the other things that may be causing those um, triggers? So emotional eating sounds like it's just because you're upset, but it actually is just kind of an umbrella under which other things would fall like boredom or stress, anger, all these types of things fall under emotional eating. So to identify that, I mentioned the tracking and the journaling that can help, but even just asking yourself when you're eating, am I actually hungry? Um, recognizing hunger and fullness sounds like it should be intuitive and simple, but like I said, a lot of what our culture reinforces is for us to ignore those cues. And especially if you're someone that has dieted or tried several diets in the past, you may have kind of gotten away from your body's own cues. Um, so learning to recognize those, considering how does your body communicate to you? You may not get stomach pains when you're hungry, but do you feel a lack of energy or an inability to concentrate? Do you get a headache? What are, how does your body communicate to you? Um, something else to consider. When's the last time I ate? Especially if you're used to ignoring hunger signals, timing of your meals can help you kind of get back into that hunger and fullness cycle. So if it's been more than four or five hours since you've eaten, it's likely that it's time to, to give some nourishment to your body. Um, what did you eat the last time you ate? Maybe you didn't get enough balance or variety at your meal, and so it's only been a few hours, but you feel hungry. So you need to consider those factors as well. Um, again, why am I eating? We'll talk a little bit more about identifying hunger in a minute. And what do I want to eat? What's going to be most satisfying to you at that time? And that can change from day to day. Um, also, you know, considering schedule changes or what's convenient the times that are convenient for you to eat during the day and trying to allow yourself breaks enough where you have some regular eating times. So this is what we refer to as the hunger scale. You can also think of it as hunger as a pendulum that's going to be swinging on a clock. From one end, you have a one, which is emptiness, feeling very hungry, extreme hunger. You've probably gone all day or more without eating. On the other end of the swing, you have a 10. So you've eaten, overeaten to the point where you feel sick. I always refer to that as just feeling Thanksgiving full. Most people can recognize that feeling. In the middle is a five, so feeling neutral. Not really hungry. Um, you probably can't be satisfied there for a long time, but you're feeling okay. 
So trying to be aware of where you are on that scale can help you identify when it's time to eat. So as you're you know, starting to feel hunger, we want you to try and stop and recognize that between a three and a four. So at a four, you're starting to feel some hunger pains, um, but you know you could go a little bit longer without eating, but you're starting to think about food. At a three, you're definitely hungry. Um, you know, you can't go any longer without eating. So we want to start to recognize it even at a four to start to recognize that. And then as we stop and honor our hunger and start to eat, we want to eat slowly. There's actually a hormonal signal that goes between your stomach and your brain that helps you to feel fullness, but that can't generally complete um, in less than 20 minutes. So trying to eat and take enough time to chew your food and, and think about um, you know, are you actually feeling satisfied with what you're eating? And there's lots of factors that go into that. But as far as the scale, recognizing at a six, you know, I'm starting to feel full, um, but I probably could eat a little bit more to be able to be satisfied for a period of time. At a seven, we're full, we're satisfied. We know that we won't need to eat for another maybe four hours. So consider those things as you're eating. Um, just as with most behaviors, there's the ABC approach that we use. So there's an antecedent. When it, what is triggering us to eat or what was the reason that caused us to eat? What was the eating behavior then? And then after we engage in that eating behavior, what are the consequences that came from that? And that can help you again in evaluating your relationship with food or um, kind of what's going on with your eating habits. So this is just an example. For example, A, the antecedent is I was home alone. I felt lonely. That's the situation, um, the emotion that I was feeling, which led to B, my behavior. I ate half a bag of cookies and half a bag of chips. So that's an eating behavior. The consequence that came from that is that the food improved my mood initially, but then I felt guilty. So those feelings and attitudes that happen after the behavior. So in tracking or journaling, those are the types of things that you're trying to observe without making judgments, um, but just observing what your, your regular habits or behaviors are. So in trying to identify hunger and fullness, um, if you ask that question, why am I eating? And you identify something other than hunger. For example, I know that I'm stressed or I'm feeling bored or I'm feeling lonely. Um, try to come up with a plan in advance of something that could take the place of eating the behavior. Um, I think coming up with a plan in advance is what's going to help you be most successful. When we're in the moment, it's easier to fall back on what we're used to and what's worked for us um, before. Um, but learning from, you know, the journaling and the tracking, you can identify, like in the example I just gave you, I used food for an emotional coping strategy that didn't actually address my underlying need. I learned that. So what can I do differently going forward? So if I'm home alone and I'm feeling lonely, maybe I need to call a friend or maybe I need to write a letter or you know whatever it is, something that's going to actually address the underlying need so that after that behavior, you feel more satisfied. And I just want to mention, I'm not saying that you can't ever enjoy eating for comfort or for coping. All of us do that to an extent, but when eating is your only coping strategy, or we refer to it as the only tool in your coping toolbox, that's when um, it, things can be difficult. So for coping skills, it's usually a combination of things that can help you deal with things like stress um, and those difficult situations where you're triggered to eat. So trying to, in your, in your plan, think of things that will help you to relax, that will help you to um, lower your stress, that will help you to um, be more active. Those are things that you might wanna include in that plan that's gonna take place of eating in those, in those situations. Even writing the plan down can kind of solidify it in your mind so that you can be more um, successful with it going forward. We do know that exercise, as far as addressing mood and emotional eating, is still the most effective mood regulating behavior. So that's something to consider as you think about your coping skills. 
Okay, so one thing I like to talk about when someone comes in to see me is more about what can I add to help me feel better with what I'm eating to help my health before we get into things that you feel like you have to eliminate from your diet. There's usually for most people something that you can do to add more food or more nutrition to your diet that will help you feel better. Um, and it's not just about, you know, avoiding or restricting. So, and, and a good definition of a sensible diet um, includes, um, again, getting rid of that vocabulary as any food being good or bad. Um, generally adding more produce. So a diet that includes, you know, produce, whether it's fresh or frozen um, in a variety is a sensible diet. Aiming for balance at your meals. Do you tend to only eat protein? Do you tend to only eat vegetables? Aiming for a balance and variety is gonna give you more nutrition at your meals and will likely help you feel better um, and more satisfied during the day. Including fiber, we're gonna talk more about that. Drinking water, we're gonna talk more about that. Um, if there are things that you feel like are difficult for you as far as portion sizes or just extras that you don't feel necessarily are giving you much satisfaction in your diet, those might be the things that you focus on reducing. But before that, thinking through all of these other things on maybe what you could add. Trying to avoid extremes in diet, which is hard to do, um, especially, you know, in our culture where there's lots of diets readily available. Um, be aware of diets that encourage removing an entire, for example, carbohydrates. Those are very common um, food group to uh, restrict on diets that are popular right now. Um, think about when you remove an entire food group from your diet over a long period of time, or even a short period of time, you can, you're removing all of those nutrients that are provided by that food group. So by trying to get a variety and a balance and watching portions, instead of restricting a whole food group, you're more likely to get the adequate nutrition that you need and feel better. And it's more sustainable in the long run. So for an example, fiber is good. So, you know, like most things for our culture, if a little bit is good, then a lot is better. But in, in the case of fiber, that would be a good example. We, you know, generally trying to have a good fiber intake or increasing your fiber is a good thing. But if you do too much or too quickly, you can have negative side effects like bloating and constipation. But if you were to add fiber in small amounts gradually in a sustainable way where it's consistent, you're less likely to experience those side effects. Um, over restricting calories, or I would add, you know, skipping meals, for example, often results in overeating. Um, your body has an innate drive for survival, which includes adequate nutrition. So if you tend to skip meals or you go a long period without eating, it's likely that you will overeat at the next meal and be less um, in control of what choices that you're making. Um, because our hunger has gotten to the point where anything will satisfy us. Foods or diets that include too much prep time, are those really sustainable for you? Um, so think about, could I follow this pattern of eating for three to six months or a year or beyond? Weight loss that occurs with a, with a, um, a limited diet amount of time. So if you follow a diet, but it's, you're not able to sustain it, the weight loss that occurs generally is regained and oftentimes more than the original weight. So when we're talking about things to add, and we'll get a little bit more detailed in a minute, but these are generally the things that we talk about trying to add more of in your diet. And the reason is, is because there's actually evidence and studies that are done that show when you include these foods in your, in your diet on a regular basis, it helps you to feel better. It helps to reduce risk of, of illness and certain diseases, helps with digestion, helps to our body to function um, efficiently. So these are things that you know, we would encourage more of, and not all of them are food related. Um, exercise is important as well, but so is sleep. Um, not getting enough sleep can actually, you know, um, sabotage your, your efforts for good nutrition and health. So let's look a little bit more in detail about what that looks like. So when we're talking about balance, 
I'm sure a lot of you have seen this My Plate Planner. Um, this is kind of the new Food Guide Pyramid, if you are familiar with that. But really, the focus on this is to show variety in the food groups that are represented, but also balance in the portions that are shown. Um, so you can see half the plate can be vegetables. Vegetables are really great for fiber, lots of antioxidants and nutrients that are important in those foods. Protein at each of your meals is important. Protein helps you to build muscle, helps in a lot of different functions um, in our body, also helps you to be more satisfied for a longer period of time. Carbohydrates. Um, carbohydrates are important for energy. Oftentimes whole grains are providing other nutrients that are important as well, um, including fiber. So trying to get a balance of those things um, and not you know, having extreme diets where you're eliminating a food group or you're overeating on certain foods and not eating other foods, you're more likely to feel um, the energy that you want to feel as well as sustained satisfaction with what you're eating. Let me just show you another representation. So we have the basic plate method. So that's using like a nine inch plate. Um, it's showing kind of portion sizes. So lots of produce at the meal, some protein, Carbohydrate, which comes from grains, but also comes from dairy and fruits. So those are all you know, good foods to include in your diet, but in moderation. And that's what's represented in the portions on the, on, on the plate in the different colors. There is a lower carb plate um, that's often used for people with diabetes who are trying to um, you know, monitor blood sugars and that type of thing. But it does still include some carbohydrate, including um, starches and dairy and fruit, just in smaller amounts. So as far as what to add more of, I thought I said we'd get a little bit more into detail. So this would be, you know, looking at the protein on your plate. Generally, we recommend trying to include lean proteins. So that would come from things like fish, but also um, lean cuts of, you know, poultry, um, even pork, occasional red meat. The leaner red meat would be the better option. So you can you know, when you're shopping for meat, you can see the fat on the white fat on the outside of the meat. That's usually easily removed. It's when the the meat is um, mar has marbling or that you know white marbling throughout the meat. That's the fat that's hard to get rid of, and that's what contributes to um, higher cholesterol levels and plaque buildup and heart disease. So, trying to limit the intake of those types of things. Um, with fish, we recommend trying to get one to two servings per week of a fatty fish. If um, so, an example might be sa salmon. Salmon's pretty popular, or tuna. Um, we know that including fish in your diet regularly helps to um, lower your risk of heart disease and stroke. It, it, it um, includes, you know, lots of omega three fatty acids, which are good for health. So, including fish regularly is something I would say try and add. Um, you can see the other lean meats that are represented there, but also portion size. So about the size of the palm of your hand, or you saw on the plate, about a quarter of the plate is what we're aiming for there. Other proteins can come from um, eggs or low fat dairy products. Also plant sources of protein like nuts and beans and lentils, um, even soy. So those are all things that you can include trying to get a variety in what you're eating. Okay, so fruits and veggies, the top tips for those, try and aim for about five portions of fruits and vegetables daily. So a portion is roughly a cup if it's raw or a half a cup if it's cooked. So I gave some examples there of what a serving would look like. Um, but trying in general to get a variety. You can see in that picture all the colors of the different fruits and vegetables and those different colors uh, mean different nutrients that you're getting from those. So trying to get a variety means you're getting a variety of, of nutrients in your diet. So, um, you know, leafy greens are great. Crucifers is just fun to say, but that's also things like, you know, broccoli, Brussels sprouts, um, cauliflower, those types of things um, have been linked with a lower risk of age-related diseases like cancer and heart disease. And they're also rich in fiber and vitamins. Um, sometimes we get questions on, you know, should it be fresh? Should it be frozen? Really just getting produce in your diet is the goal. So however that can be done, if you find that you buy a bunch of fresh produce and it goes to waste, 
maybe getting frozen would be a better option for you because you're more likely to use it if it doesn't go bad and it's already you know cut and, and chopped up for you to use. So you kind of need to think about what your own um, habits are and how it would fit in. With whole grains, um, the goal is to try and make half of your grain intake be from whole grains. So versus, you know, like a refined bread, like the white bread, for example. So whole grains just has to do with, you know, um, they don't they don't strip down the outer layers of the grain. And so you're you do get all of the nutrients. They don't have to fortify it, but you also get more fiber from whole grains as well. So things like oats, quinoa, all those that are list, listed there, popcorn is actually considered a whole grain. Um, they, you know, whole grains do provide important nutrients um, and they also help to lower the risk of heart disease and stroke. They give you energy, they help increase satiety. So those are something to include, you know, in a variety um, at your meals. So for anyone older than two years of age, we would recommend low, low fat dairy. We know that, you know, Foods that are higher in saturated fats tend to increase cholesterol and risk for heart disease. So choosing lower fat dairy products um, would be recommended um, for anyone over the age of two. There's lots of uh, nutrients that milk provides, you can see on that slide, um, that help in lots of different ways with different functions in your body. Obviously the most um, you know, well-known one is how it helps with bone and teeth health. Um, it can reduce the risk of stress fractures. Um, but there are also other nutrients in milk that can help in other ways. Um, the potassium can help with blood pressure um, and preventing stroke. It's associated with lower risk of type 2 diabetes. Um, even using milk for um, fuel, refueling after an exercise um, helps to provide protein and some of those electrolytes that you use during exercise. Um, I'm seeing some of the questions pop up. I saw the question on almond milk. So almond milk um, has some of these vitamins that are fortified, like the calcium, for example, but almond milk does not have um, the carbohydrate or the um, amount of protein that cow's milk would have. Soy milk does have the protein and can be fortified with calcium. So as far as like something that's, you know, more equivalent, it would, be more of this, the soy milk as far as protein is concerned. Okay, so the next part of this is to um, consider how much of these things you are eating. Um, you know, and again, in talking about the diets that are common and more popular now, it seems for people that it's easier to eliminate a whole food group than to reduce portion size, um, which is interesting. I feel like if, you know, if we're able to just reduce the amounts that we're eating, um, we would see some of the same results as far as weight that you get from, you know, restricting a whole food group. Because um, bottom line there is that it's just less calories. So if you can do it by with, you know, without restricting a whole food group and still getting a variety of foods and reducing portions, you're reducing the calories, but you're still getting the nutrients that you need from all of those groups. So there's different ways you can do that. I don't necessarily tell people that they should measure or weigh foods, but you know, if you want to do that once to just kind of see what you're used to eating, that might be an eye-opening experience for some people. You know, if you think you're only, we tend to underestimate the amounts that we eat. So maybe measuring once just to see what you're normally eating. There's also this um, hand method where, you know, the palm size for your meat um, for your protein is about three ounces. They're showing the thumb for fats like seeds and nuts or things like peanut butter. A cup serving is about a fist size. A half a cup is about your, you know, cup tan size. So that's what it's illustrating there. So those are just ways to kind of, you know, um, eyeball portions. It could be helpful when you're eating out, for example, because oftentimes we're given you know, platters of food as our serving, as our serving dish. So um, it, serving sizes kind of can look skewed in that situation. So using, you know, your hand to estimate portion size can be helpful. It's most helpful for people that are trying to, you know, count carbohydrates for diabetes and that type of thing. Snacks. So does a healthy diet mean you can't snack? No. 
again, we, you know, go back to evaluating hunger and fullness. And some people are going to need snacks. Some people are not going to need snacks. It may depend on, you know, what you're eating at your meals, um, how long you're going between meals, you know, based on your schedule. It could um, be related to blood sugar. So there's, you can't really, you know, assume that what one person is doing would be best for you, but snacking can be part of healthy eating. I think in general, we're trying to recognize hunger and honor hunger. So planning to eat about every three to five hours generally will do that. For people that are more active, they might need to have more frequent snacks. Um, so what is snacking versus grazing? A snack typically is something that is portioned out. There's a beginning and an end to that eating experience. With grazing, it's typically, I think of like the open bag scenario, right? Where it's on your desk or you're watching a show and, and the bag is open, you haven't portioned anything, you just kind of continually um, nosh on whatever is you know in your hand. So there's not really a starting point, there's not a stopping point, there's not a portion. That's what grazing would be kind of throughout the day. Um, so as far as what to eat for a snack, getting a good balance because we're trying to be satisfied. We're trying to satisfy our hunger. So around 250 calories is a good, good amount for a snack. That's going to vary again on the person, but trying to get some protein and some sort of fiber. So whether that comes from a whole grain or a fresh fruit or fresh vegetable, something like that um, is a combination that generally will satisfy you until your next meal. Okay, so meal planning and timing. I think everybody knows the answer to this. What happens when there is no plan? We default to cheap, fast, and tasty, right? You go, you're starving on the way home from work. You don't have a plan for dinner. You're going to go through the drive through and everything is going to sound good. That's how, our, that's how we're made. You know, we're meant to be hungry and solve the problem by whatever is available. If we um, have a plan, you know, and, and eating out can be part of a plan, but I think when we go to eat out without a plan, that's when we make you know, poor choices in what we're choosing or the amount that we're choosing. Also, how frequently you're eating out you know, is important to consider as well. But if we can plan, and that looks different for everybody, whether it's just a few days at a time, or if you're planning for a week or two of meals, um, you tend to do better with getting the balance tends to be, um, cheaper than actually, you know, going, eating out on the run and not having a plan. Um, and you tend to just feel better with what you've been eating. So again, timing is everything. You need to fuel your body regularly. So plan to eat every three to five hours. The benefit is that this helps keep your blood sugar steady. It helps keep your digestion and your GI system moving regularly. Um, your less likely to eat emotionally or stressy because you're satisfied and you're aware of when you're feeling hungry. Um, it helps to decrease late night eating. So often what we see is for people that skip meals, a lot of times that nighttime meal, they overeat and then they continue eating throughout the evening because they're having a hard time reaching the point of satisfaction. Okay, we know that there are barriers to planning and that's something that you need to consider for yourself. You know, what are the things that are keeping me from having a plan? Is it your schedule? Is it, you know, kids activities? There's lots of things that might be a barrier for planning. So trying to consider those, be aware of those and then come up with some solutions for yourself. Something that works well is to try and make a list for your family of what your top 10 meals might be. Um, and then out of those 10, maybe three that you know you have the ingredients for on hand all the time. And you don't need a recipe. You just know how to make it. It doesn't take a lot of time. So that on those nights where even if you had something planned and it, you just don't end up having time to make what you planned, there's something else that you can fall back on instead of having to go out to eat when you haven't planned to. Um, you can also, you know, obviously you can meal prep in advance and freeze things. Um, even using leftovers, leftovers are my favorite night. It's meal planning and you don't have to cook. So some people don't like leftovers. So you need to consider that in your meal plan. Um, 
you know, don't overwhelm yourself with trying to try a bunch of new recipes all at once. If you'd like to try and explore new recipes, you know, do it at a pace that's sustainable. So maybe just one new recipe or one new cooking method a week. Um, plan for meals that you will eat out. So if you know that this certain day of the week, all your kids have sports and it's just crazy, maybe that's the night that you plan to eat out. In addition, when you eat out, what are the places that you normally go to? And what are you gonna plan to eat when you go to that restaurant? So having a plan before you go to the restaurant helps you to stay more within you know, the guidelines that you're trying to follow. Um, snacking is part of the plan. So trying, you know, having those snacks available helps you to um, choose things when you're hungry that will help you be satisfied. Um, you know, whether that's at work or at home, um, there's some things that are listed there as suggestions. It's not to say that you can't use a convenient snack once in a while. I mean, th there's a reason that those are made because people don't have time always to prepare. Um, so just keep in mind what, what your schedule is and what your snacking habits are and what will work best for you. But, you know, if you have snacks at work, then yeah, you wanna to plan to have some things maybe in the refrigerator or at your desk, in your desk that you know are, are things that you would like to have and available. So meal planning, that could look like, um, you know, things that are easy to prepare, especially if you're really busy with lots of different schedules. Um, try slow, cook, slow cooker meals if you haven't done those. Um, there are, you know, depends on kind of what your budget is, but there are companies available that either deliver ingredients and the recipe that make it easier and cut down on prep time. Um, there are local companies that even deliver those freezer dump meals, like, you know, it's all in the bag and you just put it in the slow cooker. And that might be something that you want to incorporate to make one, at least one night a little bit easier. Um, so, you know, it just kind of depends on what your own needs are, and that's going to be different from the next person. So there's lots of different websites you can go for, go to for meal ideas. Um, there is an abundance of those. So these are just some that we have made a list of, um, and some of those include those meal delivery services as well. Um, you know, I mentioned earlier that Yes, I can send the slides. So if you would like a copy of that list, um, that's not a problem. So considering the satisfaction factor, this kind of goes back to, you know, as we're eating, are we actually enjoying what we're eating? Are we eating to a point where we're satisfied? If we're not eating enough at our meals, we're more likely to snack or graze throughout the day. So trying to, and, you know, not eating enough could look like maybe I'm only eating one thing. I'm not getting a balance or a variety at or maybe I'm not eating enough protein, or maybe I've cut out all the fat in my diet and I need to add a little bit of some healthy fat back to help me feel more satisfied at my meals. So we do want you to be, be satisfied with what you're eating. Um, and we want you to enjoy what you're eating. That's, you know, we're not trying to say that that shouldn't be a part of eating. But again, if you feel like eating is your only comfort or coping strategy, then maybe you need to look a little bit closer at your relationship with food. So the satisfaction factor, if you've heard of intuitive eating, it was um, originally the idea came from um, this book, Intuitive Eating by Evelyn Triboli. She's a dietitian, um, but there's lot, you'll hear intuitive eating coming from lots of different sources. So their, their intuitive eating is based on about, I think the 11 different principles. Um, that will help you to establish a healthy relationship with food. And when you read through them, if you haven't, a lot of them are counter, countering what our diet culture is enforcing. So, you know, you think about a toddler. Um, when I think about intuitive eating, that's kind of what I think about. A toddler will eat when they're hungry. You can put food in front of them and they will refuse it unless they are hungry most of the time. Even if they're having a cookie, they can take one bite and put it down and run away and and be satisfied. As adults, I feel like somewhere in there, we, we get away from those intuitive signals that our body gives us for hunger and satiety. And then we start to get the diet culture definitions of good and bad and foods we shouldn't be eating and it can get very confusing. So the intuitive eating, um, this is a really good book if you wanna you know, want a good resource. Um, there's also a workbook that talks through the um, principles of intuitive eating that can be helpful, especially if you've um, experienced a lot of different diets in your life and feel like 
your relationship with food could be improved. Anyway, I start to ramble, but the satisfaction factor is that you're eating what you really want an environment that is inviting um, and so that you'll feel satisfied and content. Our culture is very different. We're usually, most people are eating in a hurry. They haven't set aside time to eat. Um, they're eating you know, while they're distracted, so while they're doing something else. And so it takes away from that satisfaction um, as you eat. So diet culture diminishes our quality of life in many ways. So decreased satisfaction in eating is one of them. Eating foods you enjoy and that feels good is a way to connect with your body more deeply. Satisfaction is a pleasure-based principle and the hub of intuitive eating. So satisfaction should be part of a healthy relationship with food. And that doesn't mean, you know, that does mean including foods that you, you enjoy. Um, once in a while to have something that's, you know, sweet and like something you feel like is an indulgent to you, that's part of intuitive eating. I mean, that's all part of normal eating. Um, but our, our culture has just kind of done this vocabulary definition of what's good and bad. And so we've kind of got away from, you know, what is normal intuitive eating. Um, so if you're feeling like you're in a rut, whether it's meal planning or, you know, with you feel like you just really don't like vegetables, it's hard for you to add produce to your meals, try and um, experiment a little bit. Explore different foods, explore a different vegetable if you always eat the same one. Um, you know, present it in a different way, um, cook it in a different way. Those are ways that can maybe increase your um, satisfaction when you're eating those types of foods. Okay, the 80-20 rule. 80-20 um, guideline and fun food. So we call, we don't really call any foods junk food or bad foods, we refer to them as fun food, which would mean they're less nutritious than, you know, your fruits and vegetables and whole grains. Um, Overall, I think a lot of times people are surprised, even in diabetes education, we still teach them how to include those favorite foods, um, those fun foods once in a while, because we know that if you take all of those out, that is not realistic for the long run. You have to eat this way for the rest of your life, which is less likely to happen if you're not satisfied and enjoying what you're eating. So recognizing that, you know, if you're eating, you know, like that plate 80% of the time, there's room for some of those fun foods without, um, you know, causing a big difference in your weight gain or in your health. So I think to recognize that, you know, it's really the law of averages over time. Some days you're going to eat more. Maybe you're just hungrier. Maybe you were more active the day before. Um, so your hunger is going to vary from day to day, and that's very normal and natural. Um, it's not going to be, which is different from, you know, say if you're on a diet that's prescribing you a certain amount of calories or a certain number of points per day um, that you have to stick to every day. Well, that might be more than you need in one day. It might be less than you need in one day. And so recognizing that the way we eat um, is really about the law of averages in the long run. We want you to enjoy what you're eating, and that's going to help you have a more positive um, and healthy relationship with food. Um, so, you know, for example, there are always going to be things that kind of throw you off your regular um, routine of eating. That could be the weekend. It could be you're going on vacation, going on a road trip. So, again, going back to having a plan, planning some things that will help keep you on track, knowing that you're not going to be, you know, eating exactly the way that you normally do, but allowing yourself some grace there and knowing that I can practice resilience and I know when I get back from my vacation, I can get back to what I normally eat. It's not, it's not gonna, you know, ruin everything I've been trying to do. So planning for eating out, like I talked about um, alcohol, we haven't talked about quite yet, we're about to get to, but also staying active during those times. So alcohol, what about alcohol? People have questions, is it carbs, the sugar? Um, really it's neither. Um, it is higher in calories than um, carbohydrates but it's actually digested a little bit differently. So your body's priority when you're drinking or eating is to metabolize alcohol first. So um, it's important that you do eat if you're having alcohol, especially for people with diabetes. Sometimes they feel like, well, I'm drinking alcohol, so I'm gonna use my carbs with that, I'm not gonna eat. But it's important that you do eat. Um, and in moderation is the guideline. So what is considered a drink? Um, and I've listed that there as far as volume of beverages. 
Um, and the idea is that moderation is key. So one drink a day for a woman, two drinks a day for a man, for a man is what's considered moderation. If you feel like, you know, that's something that you, um, you know, as far as intake, you're, you're drinking too much as far as calories are concerned, that's, that's where I was talking about the extras. Is that a, is that a place where you could maybe decrease your intake of that um, to help with the nutrition in your diet? So this kind of just summarizes, you know, what I was talking about before, that there's going to be, um, you know, detours to this journey and recognizing that that's normal and that it's the overall average of what you're eating that is most important as far as health in the long run. Hydration. So most of your body is made up of water, so it's essential for your body to function properly. What is the perfect amount of water to drink in a day? You're going to hear the standard 64 ounces a day, which is eight cups, eight, eight ounce cups of water. But you can also get that through herbal tea. You can get it through um, sugar free um, beverages like Crystal Light, for example. And everyone's not everyone's needs are going to be exactly the same. Um, it's going to depend on you know your size. It's going to depend on your activity, what the temperature is, all sorts of things. So 64 ounces is just kind of a generic standard. The best indicator for you is going to be, and dietitians talk about this all the time, um, the color of your urine. So using, um, I'm going to show you this slide. We're aiming for light lemonade. That's our goal to know that we're really well hydrated. You don't need to hydrate yourself to the point where you're having to go to the bathroom every 10 minutes. That would be overhydration, and it's really not doing you any benefit other than, I guess, keep making you get up and walk every 10 minutes. So, um, you know, signs of hydration or dehydration, I should say, obviously thirst, um, dry lips and dry mouth, flushed skin, headache. Um, oftentimes, you know, there are symptoms that are mistaken for hunger, and that's why it can be confusing. So, trying to drink regularly throughout the day. Um, can help you feel better um, and can help, um, I think, you to feel more satisfied throughout the day, too, just in general. Um, so that's kind of the, the nuts and bolts of what I wanted to share today. And also just to let you uh, know that we are available here at St. Mark's. We have dietitians, we have social workers, we do have a nurse practitioner in our office um, who works with people for non-surgical and surgical weight loss. We have our diabetes education office. Um, so we are here to help meet any needs you may have. These are our contacts, this is our contact information. And I'd be happy to try and answer any questions that I didn't see pop up on my screen earlier. Megan, this is Andrea. Can you just um, talk a little bit about intermittent fasting? That is kind of the one I'm hearing a lot of people evangelizing lately. So yeah. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, sure. So intermittent fasting, you know, there's um, there's lots of ways you can do intermittent fasting. I think the bottom line with intermittent fasting is that you are reducing your calorie intake. For some people who have a really hard time not snacking and eating in the evening, that might be beneficial to them, um, you know, to, to, you know, cut that evening time out of their eating window so that um, they're not tempted, for example, in the evening to eat. Um, I think overall, um, inter intermittent fasting can be useful for people. It's not to say that it's something I wouldn't recommend, but if, if you're not eating regularly, it kind of depends. There's, you know, lots of different windows as far as how, how long you're eating and how long you're not eating. I would say, you know, you would want to use something that you're still eating pretty regularly every four to five hours. A lot of people use the like um, 11 a.m. to 7 p.m. So they're still trying to get three meals, but it can be difficult to get all your nutrition in a abbreviated amount of time. And it can be difficult for people that are monitoring blood sugars as well. Um, so there are lots of different um, factors to consider. It's something that can be useful. Um, I think as far as weight management and diets in general, there are lots of um, you know, effective ways to lose weight in the short term. I think my question is always, is that something that you can sustain in the long run? Um, if that answers your question, hopefully. Oh, that's good. Thank you. Mm -hmm. 
Um, if anyone else has questions, feel free to put them in the chat so that uh, Megan can see them. We've got just a couple minutes for questions. Andrea, there's a question. Um, any advice for a teenager that has food texture aversion? That's a good question. And I guess um, I would ask more questions, you know, to get an idea of how severe the food aversions are, if it's affecting their growth. Um, or, you know, if they're malnourished because of it, there are dietitians that specialize in that type of thing. And it's a very, um, you know, there's simple baby steps that they take along the way of introducing new foods. Um, and it, a lot of it is just exposure kind of therapy. So, you know, it takes a lot of repetition and it might be that you put it on a plate next to them and then it's on their plate. It's just about acceptance before they actually try it. So I would say, um, you know, if you feel like you're really concerned about that and, and the um, child's health and growth, um, I would recommend looking into a dietitian that can do some of that exposure therapy um, for your child. Megan, there's a question in the chat. What are some of the on hand snacks that you like to have? Um, so it, it kind of depends on, like, personally for me, I know that I need to have, like I was suggesting on the slides, I need to have like something that's going to be substantial, something like that has some fiber and some protein in it. As far as, you know, preferences, that's going to vary from person to person, but, um, you know, like vegetables and hummus or, you know, cheese and apples or peanut butter and apples or, you know, and I do use convenience bars too, because I'm a working mom. I don't have time to always plan snacks, but, um, you know, even things like Greek yogurt and some fruit, um, you just, you kind of have to experiment with what will work for you, but generally getting a combination of some fiber, um, and some protein. Nuts are a great snack as well. It's just hard to limit the portion sometimes, uh, especially if you're really hungry in between. So having nuts with something else um, can help with that. Another question I have seen is, is it worth it to eat organic foods? That's a good question. Um, so, I, my recommendation is always, you know, what, what, how does that fit in to your budget? Um, a lot of times organic foods are more expensive. And would I say, if you can't eat organic, don't have fruits and vegetables? No. Um, I think that's kind of a personal choice, but I don't think you have to buy organic to be, you know, eating healthy. Good. Thank you. Megan, here's one. It says, do you have a recommendation for getting more fiber in a soft food diet? That's a good question. Um, so with, I guess I would have to ask more questions about, you know, why they're on a soft food diet as far as, you know, medical conditions and that type of thing. Um, Generally, you know, for soft food, I mean, it could be for texture reasons or for more like bowel reasons. I'm not sure, but, um, you know, adding generally soft food is going to be like canned vegetables or, um, frozen vegetables and fruits that you would be soft enough to have that would still have some fiber in them. Um, soft food versus low residue. I mean, soft food would be oatmeal. Um, which would be higher in fiber than say cream of wheat on soft food. Um, soft food generally still includes breads unless they're restricted for other reasons. So um, looking at, I would say just generally doing smaller amounts um, gradually over time and making sure that you're drinking plenty of water as you try and increase your fiber intake.
uh, last call for any questions, go ahead and put them in the chat if you have any other questions. If you're here with Salt Lake County, don't forget to uh, click on the link in the chat and get your um, healthy points there. So if you have any questions, it's your last chance to put them in the chat. Okay, so I have a question and I saw wanting to advocate for mindful intuitive eating. How do you best alter your language for sweets and not limiting a child's potential desire for them above other foods? And similarly, do you force them to stay at the table and come back a few minutes later um, for a young child? That can be tricky. I know it's hard because, you know, as a dietitian, you learn the way you're supposed to do it, and then you have children, and <laughs> it seems a lot harder. Um, I think, you know, with intuitive eating, we have to watch our language about good and bad foods and trying to prioritize one food over the other or reward, for example, if you eat your dinner, you can have a treat. Um, so I think it's more in the language and also in, in your example. Um, you know, if they see, they're gonna see what you're eating and they're gonna wanna eventually, two to five year old, it's kind of hard, they're learning those habits, but if you offer those foods regularly, fruits and vegetables and the whole grains at your meals, um, there is a book by Ellen Satter um, about feeding children and she recommends that you present those sweets at the same time that you present your dinner and then the, the child is in charge of how much and what they eat. And that can be difficult as a parent because you want them to get, you know, the healthy foods. But I think if you have more of an attitude of, you know, are you hungry and are you feeling satisfied? And maybe talk about like, how do you feel when you eat those foods and not having them available all the time, but having actual, you know, meal times and snack times can help with just the accessibility of some of those fun foods or whatever you want to call them. Okay, so there are times, oh, sorry. I meant if they don't want to stay at the table. Okay, so yeah, I didn't answer that part of your question. If they wanna stay at the table, but are hungry a few minutes later and say that they're full, but just before bed want to eat again. Yes, so I think a good way to address that might be, you know, this is our meal time. The kitchen's gonna be closed until this time where you'll have an opportunity to have a snack. But as a parent, I have actually, like my kids have refused food. I have, I have some um, kids with eating aversions um, and it can be tricky because they're also on medication that reduces their appetite, but they have gone to bed without eating because they choose not to eat what I have made. And I don't, you know, cater to that, but if they want to make themselves something, then I let them. Um, but I think as far as eating all the time and not getting enough, trying to have it like a meal time and a snack time where they're offered foods and they can choose how much. Um, does that help at all? You're welcome. Okay, so um, there are times I eat a bigger portion. How do I curb that? Or is it okay as long as I'm eating because I'm hungry? So yeah, I mean, that's, um, there are some things to consider there. I mean, Sometimes you're gonna eat more. And that's where I was talking about kind of the law of averages. Sometimes we're hungrier than other days. And you might find that on some days you eat a bigger portion, but on some days you eat less. Um, and what we eat, you know, you see the portion on the label, that doesn't necessarily have to be the portion that we're eating. I think if you are paying attention to how you're feeling, that's where I would start. Um, you know, and then kind of look at the things we talked about. Am I eating a balance? Am I getting variety? Um, if you're actually hungry, then I would say let's honor your hunger and just pay attention. Make sure you're eating slowly and paying attention to when you're starting to feel satisfied um, and recognizing that and being able to stop at that point. Okay, our time is up. Thank you so much, Megan. I think we had some good questions and discussions here. Yes, thank you. So if anyone um, has any uh, wants to attend any other of our St. Mark's seminars, they're all available on our website. But thank you all for coming tonight. Thanks. Thanks.